to go up to the box, follow Pastor Chris. When I graduated from uh, college, I went to uh, graduate school in Chicago. And while I was there, I was asked to be the head uh, leader of a Young Life Club, Deerfield High School. Toward the end of that uh, year, a, a student began uh, attending, and he learned that he was uh, diagnosed with seriously terminal cancer. I didn't know him very well. He had just come to the club. I knew him, you know, to say hi. <clears throat> but I learned from a uh, other teenager in the club that this guy wanted to talk to me. Well, in all the uh, hustle and bustle of getting out of town, I, I, work every, I worked every summer here at Valley Community Presbyterian Church, and I was taking finals and getting papers in. I never got to him. So when I got back in the fall, September, my top priority was, was calling and getting together with this, uh, this teenager. And I called, and his mom said, he died just yesterday. I thought, oh my goodness. Here's a guy that wants to talk to me about, I don't know, what happens after I die? Is there a chance I can be healed? How, how do you get right with God? How do you know you're good to go? You know, all that. And I missed that chance. There are opportunities in life that if you don't take them now, you lose them forever. There are relationships that you enter into. If you don't pursue them, you'll drift away. Jesus tells a parable that illustrates that some things we must do before it's too late. Turn to Luke 13, 6 to 9. This is a short parable of Jesus, gives no explanation as to what it means. Then he told this parable, a man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard. And he went to look for fruit on it, but it did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year, and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. Lord Jesus, be our teacher this morning. You gave this parable years ago. Tell us what you meant then and what it means for our lives today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In this parable, it seems reasonably clear that the owner represents God, the caretaker represents Jesus, and the tree represents us. It becomes clear from the parable that God calls us to bear fruit. I'd like to make four observations about this calling on our lives to bear fruit one, God created us to bear fruit. The owner of the vineyard wanted to, wanted to see fruit on his fig tree. God created us for a purpose. Uh, what God told the prophet Jeremiah is true for you and me today. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. God sent his son to save you and me. In God's kingdom, like Jeremiah, you have a place, you have a purpose, you have a role, you have a function to fulfill. This gives your life great significance and special value. You are not God's child by this service, but as God's child, you were created for this service. Apostle Paul writes, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. We were created, each of us, to do good works, to bear fruit. Jesus says, this is to my Father's glory that, glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. God created us to serve him, serve people and make a difference in the world. Jesus came to serve and he calls us to do the same. Jesus said, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You are God's hands and eyes and feet and heart in this world. Your service is desperately needed in the body of Christ. No matter where you serve, the church is a critical outpost for advancing God's kingdom. 
Each of us has a role to play and every role is important. There is no small or insignificant function for you to take in the church. Some acts of service are visible. Others are behind the scenes, but all are valuable. Small or hidden ministries often make the biggest difference. Jory and I have a chandelier in our dining room. When you turn it on, it lights up the room. But I doubt that's the most important light in our house. My guess is uh, more important is the little night light that's in the hallway between Erica's room and our room so that Erica doesn't stumble or Jory and I don't stumble in the middle, middle of the night. God calls us to bear fruit. Two, God expects us to bear fruit. The owner in the parable came and rightfully expected to find figs on his tree. When we moved into our house 17 years ago, we planted six or eight uh, blueberry bushes. First couple of years, didn't get any blueberries. But then we had, a, we had a string of maybe 10 years where they were doing pretty good. And we'd get six, seven, eight bowls of blueberries off of them. Now the last few years, they're back to their old ways. And we're lucky to get a bowl. When we plant bushes, we expect to get fruit from them. God created and planted us in this world. We are his trees. Does he not have a right to expect us to bear fruit? Jesus was addressing the people of Israel. They were the people God had appointed his representatives in the world to point people to God, but they were not bearing fruit. Never has a nation been given as much as our nation. Our country was founded predominantly by followers of Christ. God has blessed this nation spiritually and materially. God has a right to expect fruit from us. God said to Abraham, the father of uh, the nation of Israel, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Those words were spoken to Abraham and the, the nation of Israel but the, uh, who were the people of God in the Old Testament. But the people of God today are people who have put their trust in Christ. And so those words are true for us. God expects us to be a blessing to the world, to serve the world. All Christians are called to full-time service. Sometimes we miss our call to service. I grew up in Santa Rosa, California, an hour north of, north of San Francisco. And uh, we lived in a planned community. The centerpiece of it was the country club. Nice golf course, uh, Olympic-sized swimming pool, a couple jacuzzis, a couple saunas, a place where you could order, you know, hamburgers and, you know, small things. And every day people would set out the lawn chairs around the pool. And we kind of learned how it worked. You know, we, you pay a relatively small monthly fee. And for that, people will serve you so you can live a life of leisure. Well, that mentality can easily move into the church. You say, I, I put a few bucks in the offering and I expect to be served. I expect to come and have a worship service that ministers to me and uh, something for my children and groups I can be involved in. But church was never expected to be a country club. God calls in the church people to serve. It's not a place where you just come to receive it's a place where you come to give and to make a difference. Come to Starting Point tonight if you've never attended it, and I'll share with you many ways you can be involved making a difference in this uh, body of Christ. I can help you move from the mentality of serve us to serve us. Three, God graciously gives us many opportunities to bear fruit. Verse 7, so he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree. Haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Uh, no fig tree is expected to bear fruit in the first three years, so my guess is this tree had been planted six years. And he'd be coming for three years and had found nothing. Well, any tree, fig tree that doesn't bear fruit for six years is highly unlikely to ever bear fruit. In Jewish folklore, there was a tale uh, by the man Ahigar that would have been well known to Jesus and his, uh, all the, his listeners. It went something like this. A tree that was planted by the river did not bear fruit. 
And so the owner said, cut it down. And the tree responded, oh, but just transplant me and then I'll bear fruit. And the owner said, if you didn't bear fruit when you're planted by the water, why would you bear fruit in another place? Well, Jesus takes the same story and puts a different ending on it, adds a new twist, which becomes the surprise of the parable. And the surprise of the parable is always the main point of the parable. We expect when the owner says, cut it down, that the caretaker will say, yeah, you're right, six years is enough. But instead, the caretaker responds, no, no, let's give it one more year. And there's no place in the Bible where we read about fig trees being fertilized. And so he's proposing to do something unusual. Give it special care for one more year. And we expect that the owner will say, like in the folktale, nah, it's had enough time, get rid of it. But he accepts the caretaker's advice. And that's the main point of the parable. That Jesus is patient with us. God is generous to us. He gives us more than enough opportunities to respond to him. He gives us more than enough opportunities to uh, serve him. Sir, verse 8, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dick around it and fertilize it. When I was a junior in high school, I was in a history class. And I like history. I like reading biographies. I like reading about history. And um, I'd read the textbook for that class. And so I didn't find the, the teacher's lectures all that interesting. And I also had a problem. <clears throat> I had to get my homework done at school because every morning I'd get up at 5 and I'd swim from 6 to 7.30. And then I'd swim from 3.30 to 6, and several nights of the week I had evening activities. So I really needed to get homework done in school. So I would pull out my algebra and chemistry, and I'd kind of sit behind a student in front of me so he couldn't see me, and I'd, I'd work on my homework. Well, one day he caught me. He said, Ron, I never want to see you doing homework in this class again another, from another class. Okay. Well, I was good for a week or maybe two but then, you know, I had the same pressures. I got to get my work done. And so I was doing algebra one day and I was doing it with a student behind me. He was in the next row, a couple of seats back, and we were sharing my slide rule. Now, any of you under 45 have no idea what a slide rule is, but uh, those were before, uh, you know, calculators and uh, smartphones. And uh, that's how you would do your, you know, multiplication and division and algebraic equations. And so slide rule, it slides out. And uh, so I handed it to him and then I was getting it back from him and he started playing with me. And so instead of, he held on to it. So it was bent like this. And then finally he let go. And I tell you that slide rule just took off over the heads of the students in front of me and right over the professor's head. And it went smack against the blackboard. Well, this teacher stood up, all six foot three of him. He was the, the, the high school basketball coach. He was so mad. His face looked like a tomato. And he came marching back to me. I didn't know what he was going to do. He was going to wring my neck. Thankfully, he didn't. He just said, get to the principal's office. So I went in to see the principal, and he said, Mr. Kincaid, you can't mess up in history again. If you mess up, you're going to be kicked out of the class. You're going to flunk the class. But I'll give you one more chance. That's what Jesus does in this parable. He is so gracious, so patient. When others would give up on us, he still believes in us. He still loves us. And that's the point of the parable. Maybe you're new to Christ, the whole faith in God thing. Maybe you're new to church. Maybe you're not new to that, but you're coming to this church and you're a receiver rather than a giver. Uh, you know, you're not serving his kingdom in any way. Respond to God's call upon your life today. Respond to the opportunities he offers you to serve him. Uh, respond to God's call for you to bear fruit. I'm going to give you an opportunity in a few minutes to respond to Jesus. God calls us to bear fruit. So here's what we've said so far. One, God created us to bear fruit. God expects us to bear fruit. God graciously gives us many opportunities to bear fruit. And one more observation I think we have to see from this parable. 
at some point, we run out of time to bear fruit. Verse 9, if it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. God is gracious and patient. That's the big point of this parable. But we don't have forever. I told you a couple weeks ago that in the last two months, I've done three memorial services. One for a guy who's 39, one for a guy who's 64, and another one for a guy that was 64. All three died suddenly. Their families had no warning. So we don't know how long we're going to live. Once your life ends, you don't have an opportunity to serve God in this world anymore. Your opportunity has been lost. Calvin Miller, in his trilogy, The Singer, uh, depicts uh, the singer is the Christ figure. And uh, he heals people by singing, by his melody. And uh, so he comes along town and he meets this workman, a miller who works on a stone grinder. And he's lost his arm. And he says, would you like me to heal your arm? It must be hard for you to do your work with just one arm. And the guy says, yeah, a couple harvests ago, I got in too big of a hurry and I lost my arm in the grinder. Singer says, I could heal it for you. I just healed a girl this morning. And the miller says, no, don't. You just, you're just making it worse for me. You're making me feel like a cripple. My time for healing is past. Miller says, I'm telling you, I could heal you. And the guy just says, no, stop talking. And he kind of crumples down on the ground in a spasm. He says, I don't have any more hope. Leave me alone. And he kind of expects the singer will get down on his knees with him and share in his self-pity. But he looks up and the singer's gone. God is extremely gracious. He's unbelievably patient. But if we reject his offer of forgiveness and new life in Christ long enough, eventually there will come a time when our heart is hard and we're no longer interested. If we turn down the opportunities he gives us to serve him, to make a difference in this world, there will come a time when serving is no longer interesting to us. The writer to the Hebrews says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Do you know that in the Bible, the call to follow Christ is always today? Say yes to an opportunity to serve him today when you're offered it. Whenever you feel convicted by Jesus, you have three options. The Apostle Paul is speaking to the people in Athens, the intellectual center of Greece. And he tells them about Jesus dying on the cross. And then they said he was raised from the dead. And these people had three responses. One group, when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. So that's one option. You can scoff. You can say, there's no way Jesus was raised from the dead. He's not the son of God. Forget it. Second response was, and others said, but we want to hear you again on this subject. Ah, oh, that's interesting. Jesus being raised from the dead. We should talk again. They don't respond to it right then. They, they put it off for a little while. The problem with that is if you put a response off, you may never get around to it. You may not be against Christ. You may not be against the church. You, you believe in serving the community, serving, but you never get around to doing anything about it. The third group Response was they believed. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. They believed that Jesus was the Son of God. They believed that he was raised from the dead. They joined the cause of Christ and gave their lives to serve him. Imagine you are a mountain climber and you're climbing a snow-covered mountain and you get to the very top, throw your rope over and secure it. And all of a sudden you slip off the rope and you slip down just a few feet to a ledge. So now you really have three choices. You could just give up and say, crud. And you just turn around and you just jump. That's a jump to certain death. 
Or you could say, you know, I'm just going to stay here on my ledge. You're going to get cold. You're going to freeze. You're going to die of starvation. Or your third option, you see the wind blowing and the, your rope is swinging towards you. You realize if you time it just right, you could jump and grab onto that rope again. It'll be a risk, but you can do it. Those are really our choices with God. We can reject him. We can ignore him and say, no, I'll just stay right here and I'll just stay in my place. And I'm not going to do anything. Or we can take the leap of faith and say, Jesus, I give you my life fully. I'm going to depend on you. Jesus calls us to a decision. Are we going to reject him? Ignore him, just kind of put it off and not do anything? Or are we going to say, Jesus, I want you in my life and I want to make a difference in this world. I want to bear fruit for you because I know you call us to bear fruit. Lord Jesus, thank you for this parable. It's short, but it's powerful. And we see that you call us to bear fruit. And you're very gracious. You give us lots of opportunities to respond to you, to bear fruit for you. But we don't have forever. And so I pray this would be a day of decision for many people here today. I want to give you an opportunity right now. If you feel like you've never given your life to Christ, you could do that right now where you're seated and say, Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. You rose from the dead, and I want to commit my life to following you the rest of my life. I'm going to take the jump and put my hope in you. I'm going to quit just kind of straddling, you know, the line. I'm going to go all out. Or maybe your commitment is you've committed your life to Christ, but you, you realize you need to do more to serve him, to make a difference in this world. And you say, I'm going to step forward from this time forward, and I'm going to serve you and be a difference maker in this world. I'll just give you a minute. Would you pray and talk to Jesus? Thank you, Lord Jesus, for teaching us today. <clears throat> and we do want to make a difference in this world, serving you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you take